I am talking to Justin Apodaca from RedRaiderSports.com. He is our resident Red Raiders expert, our guru. Uh, he has uh, made an appearance in the past when NC State played Texas Tech in football. Did not expect NC State to be playing Texas Tech in basketball this week. No one really did. But now that the, the situation is upon us, I am JC Zemble from the WolfpackCentral.com. You know, Texas Tech has a number six seed. NC State has a number 11 seed. You know, but it's going to be a very fascinating game because Texas Tech has got a few guys that are a little bit injured and one who's already been out for the year since December. NC State is coming off of this emotion of winning five games in five days, which has been unbelievable, a historic moment for the program to win the ACC tournament title. And it really feels like whatever happens on Thursday at 9.40 p.m. in Pittsburgh, uh, it could really be a toss-up game. I totally agree. I think that we're in the – we're going to see two teams that kind of clash in styles in a way because NC State has the big man in Burns who just can do almost anything against this ultra-thin and very small Texas Tech team. So it's going to be fascinating to see that dynamic and how they can guard him and Maybe they won't be able to and just get him in, get into a up and down game where they can tire him out. I don't know exactly how this is going to look, but like you said, NC State with one of the most miraculous runs that I've ever seen in a conference tournament to get here, and you're getting a a tech team that's can kind of do it from any way on the offensive end. And I mentioned some guys that could be game time decisions, um, two in particular. You know what? What have you? What is the kind of the latest gist on uh, Dorian Williams and Warren Washington? Okay, so Darian Williams, he is frankly, in my opinion, Texas Tech's best player. He's kind of this stretch wing type player who can shoot it. He can dribble, drive, and kick. Really, really good sense of the game, good basketball IQ, and really good defensively as well. So he's probably your biggest key. And if if he's out, it's going to be really really tough for tech to do much and he injured his left ankle he kind of sprained it in the big 12 quarterfinal last week against byu was went through warm-ups looked like he was going to play the next day against houston but they held him to for precautionary reasons i think he saw him in a boot yesterday but i believe that he will be good to go on the other hand warren washington he's been out upwards of a month now he um it was the February 12th game over Kansas at home where they won by 29 points. But he basically, he hurt his right foot. And he, my coworker, well, boss, Chris Level, he's, he does the radio show. and He sees him walk down the bench and he says, I felt something pop. That's obviously not great. So he, he's been out and he's been kind of a game time decision. He played two weeks later on that Saturday against UCF, but it was like four minutes, came out, haven't seen him since. So word is that he's been practicing and that he's going to likely give it a go, but we have no idea how effective or just well he'll be able to play for this tech team. And obviously, as most people know, it's going to be a challenge for the way that they run their offense, it's changed since Warren Washington's been out. And it's different when you have different personnel, obviously. Sure. I'll give a, a, a future tease to the audience. You know, I haven't done a written form yet of who Texas Tech reminds me of. But uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll, we'll dive into that because I'm sure some fans will be very curious on that. Because uh, after watching them play for two games, they, they do remind me of one particular team. In some ways, but before I get to that part, I want you to take people through what was the roster like when Brett McCaslin got hired, and what did he have to do to put this thing together in the last year to get a number six seed? Okay, so completely different roster from last year for the most part. Obviously, the big returner is Pop Isaacs, who had a really strong freshman year. He's always kind of been this guy who can shoot the lights out one night and then the next night he'll shoot one of 14 from beyond the arc. So you kind of don't know what you're going to get on a night-to-night -night basis, but he always seems to step up into the big games. So it'll obviously be his first NCAA tournament appearance. 
But outside of him, there's no starter or really key contributor that's back. The only two that have really played a role is Kerwin Walton and Robert Jennings. Walton really, really just a three a three point specialist. That's seemingly what he does. He can put the ball on the floor a little bit, go the rack, but not not an excellent defender, and he's not gonna be like this guy that they trust to handle the ball ton. But and then Robert Jennings, he's this he's gonna be probably your starter at the five on Thursday, just because of you know Warren Washington's status, but He's really stepped up in the last six weeks. I mean, he was going from guy you couldn't trust and like, what are we doing here? Like he just looked lost to this guy who's really been able to, you know, help and, you know, do his job and scored a little bit. He and the other big, Ameli Alajo, they've both struggled to really put it together from like getting the ball in the basket, but they've really helped out defensively and they've, you know, been able to handle themselves with the ball and, you know, running the offense that they try and do. But outside of that, it's all transfers, which Joe Toussaint has been great. He's from West Virginia. Don't know if you've ran into him against Iowa. I remember him at Iowa. State didn't yeah. Iowa, but I I remember the Joe Toussaint Iowa era. Yeah, Joe Toussaint at Iowa, and then he went to West Virginia for a year, and he's here in his final year. He's played pretty well. Obviously, he has his flaws, but you know what you're going to get. Really good defender, handles the ball, really calming presence in the offensive end. And then Darren Williams, he's been the key really since conference play started. It's even throughout the whole year, like he struggled to, I guess, fill the stat sheet. But when you're watching the game, you can see his impact. And since conference play started, he really, really got going. And against Kansas was a big game. I'm sure you saw the headline. He went, I think he shot eight of eight and was perfect and just lit, lit the world on fire for that night and just, and it was the key to winning by 29 against that kind of team on their home court. But yeah, we lose Devin Cambridge, who came over with Warren Washington from Arizona State. Those two were really the hope for any kind of length on the on the on the in the front court, just because of where they were at roster wise. And Grant got a late start because of he he stuck it through the NIT with you know, the the portal and all that stuff. And it's just been, it took them a little while to get the staff going, but there's a lot of optimism for building this roster going forward. But this year it was, it's tight and they're down two scholarship guys right now. So but where did Warren Washington originally go to college? Oh man. I know he was at Nevada Nevada. Or Oregon state. I believe it was Oregon state and then Nevada and then Arizona state. And oh, so he's, he's four schools. Yeah. It's been, it's been quite the the journey <laughs> for him. I, I just remember the Nevada part. I didn't know if he played with Dorian Williams, but they may not have played. I might yeah, have, there was no. They may um, not have had an overlap. Because Darian was a freshman last season and Warren was there the year before. Sure. So my comparison to, Nevada, uh, to Texas Tech is one through four, I see a lot of similarities in personnel to UNC. Mm -hmm. I don't see an Armando Baycott. So the whole Baycott part out of the UNC comparison, there is no Armando Baycott. But the way Texas Tech uses Pop Isaac is basically the same way UNC uses R.J. Davis. They let them do their thing. They're both fearless. They both are physically about the same size. So I would assume that NC State would use all of the rules that they used in guarding R.J. Davis this year to translate over to guarding Pop Isaac. Tucson is the Elliot Cadeau type um, a little quicker maybe than Elliot, a little older, a little bulkier, but you know, Elliot's not going to go for 20. I don't know if Tucson scored over 20 this year, but he's just kind of like a glue guy, you know, who's probably very good on defense. Um, Dorian Williams is Harrison Ingram, except Harrison wishes he had that outside game. Dorian may not be the same rugged rebounder. Is a solid rebounder, but Harrison Ingram's a very good rebounder. But they both are that small ball four that you want on the college level. And then area fans will know this comparison well. Kerwin Walton, the former UNC player, does a lot of the same things that Cormac Ryan does for UNC now. Cormac may be a little better ball handler, but their jobs are to hit three-pointers. And Kerwin obviously can shoot. And... I think the other thing I learned about Texas Tech, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, are they like the greatest three, uh, free throw shooting team in the history of basketball? 
Yes, it feels like they should knock down a where I believe um, I have Ken Palm pulled up and they are what is that? 15th in the nation at 77.8% on the year. Yeah, the but don't they have like four guys that are like over like 84% or some yeah, uh, 80, 83, 86, 87, 90. Yeah, you're yeah. four guys over 85 ish percent and then a couple more guys in the 70s. The only guy that's really struggled is Yolaho, who freshman from Finland. He's not been great knocking down the free throws, but he can shoot the three. So it's very interesting sure. to see that dynamic. Now, the, the other game within the game, very few teams have the type of personnel to muscle up with DJ Burns. Does very anybody? few teams. Very few teams. And then it becomes a pick, pick the poison. You know, do teams double team DJ? Do teams just let them get the singles and then hope they get the doubles and the triples with three pointers on the other end? You know, Obviously, everybody tries to attack DJ on the defensive end or have their center run the court, you know, but if Warren Washington is not healthy, you know, I don't know if Robert Jennings is going to score much. So that that kind of takes itself out. What is Texas Tech typically done in terms of either playing straight up or doubling a very good low post scoring big this year? Well, if you look at the Kansas game at home, they Hunter didn't... Dickinson, for instance. What would yes. they do against Hunter? So they they double a little bit, but they were mostly playing it straight up. But that was Washington, so it's kind of a different story now that you get away from that kind of team and you haven't really played a team with like a dominant center per se since you got hurt or since he got hurt. So it's been interesting. They they seem to play it straight up and they cover the ball screens by going over and playing a little bit of drop coverage. But frankly, I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know what the plan is going to be. I think obviously you're going to try and get NC state to switch on, on the other end, but on your, on your side, I don't know what you're going to do because I think that if you get Robert Jennings and Yalaho into foul trouble, boy, the wheels can come off really quick. And you, if you're playing Darian Williams at the five, like, wow, like that's a very, very real possibility because Carmen Lindsay is no longer with the program for Texas tech. He was really that third string when Warren Washington went down just didn't work out. So he's no longer with the program. And obviously Demon Cambridge is hurt. So did they ever play zone? No, never. No. It's it's been thought of or discussed mm -hmm. a little bit from what McCaslin has said in press game, in press conferences, but it doesn't seem like they'll ever go to a zone. They'll probably just play straight up. You know, I think some people got to see McCaslin coach a little bit when North Texas was going on their runs. Got a lot of people had respect for him. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I kind of probably knew, but not really that he was a Scott Drew protege in many ways, which is funny because Scott Drew for years used to run his own defense. Right. You know, do you think because of the personnel that that Texas Tech has maybe run more than those North Texas teams or maybe not as overly involved on the defensive end and the slow court play as those North Texas teams or that that he's kind of evolved with his personnel? No, oh, it's for sure the personnel. I I 100% without a doubt it is. I don't think that it's exactly what he would want. I know that he's always going to tailor his team to how they need to win. That's something they echo. And Dave Smart did it in Canada when he was winning national titles up there. So they've been able to tailor this team to do what they need, but they've really, really emphasized defense over the last three weeks since March started. And that's when they've been playing their best basketball. So I think that there's the bigger key is going to, they're going to go up and down. And I think that they're going to try and shoot it because I think that I I could be wrong, but outside of the, the guard in horn, I don't know that NC state's going to be able to like keep up if we, if tech shoots the three really well. And if they can, I guess, just live with Burns, going crazy down low, then is you make your shots, you win the game. That's kind of how I see this one playing out. But obviously, if Tech doesn't shoot it well and they have no answer for Burns, then it could be a, an ugly one. And uh, my last question, you know, you could maybe explain just how impressive Texas Tech is when they play at home. But what have they been like when they're on the road or on a neutral court situation? I would see it's a little different than the NCAA tournament with the stakes different and being so far away in Pittsburgh. But 
I bet no. I, is there like sometimes two versions of Texas Tech when they play at home because the home crowd is just that loud, that that intense? And then how are I, they on the road? I think that they sometimes chase the big moment at home. Like if you're, you know, if you feel it building, they'll maybe take a three that they shouldn't. But it, it feels like they play almost more as a team on the road on uh, these neutral sites. I mean, thinking way back to November, that feels like a, a year ago by now. But they played in the Bahamas and they took two or three. They lost to Villanova, who just missed the field. The state's been they, in that about too. They beat Vanderbilt on a neutral court. And then last week, they beat BYU pretty handedly on a neutral court. So I think that, yes, there might be something there, but. Yeah, like the losses they've taken, it's been the only really, really frustrating one on the road was UCF because at uh, at TCU, at Baylor, they were sick. And then Iowa State and Houston are just tough matchups for this team. It's kind of the same, maybe the same story in a way where you got a really strong and lengthy team, but you got Burns, is the dude who's just can't be stopped down low. But it'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. I yeah, like a, to answer your question, dude, sorry to go on the tangent, but I just – I don't think that there's that big of a difference and maybe they even play more in McCaslin's system on the road than they do at home. Yeah, it's inter- I mean, you mentioned Vanderbilt and BYU. That's the – I don't know if there's a third overlapping opponent, but State also played them. Um, Vanderbilt did not have their their leading scorer point guard for the game. and He was out for was that one too. by far the best team, better team with ease. The BYU game was kind of like a microcosm of this season during the regular season for State. Mm -hmm. BYU, State had them. Like, they were in a good position. And in the second half, BYU just would not miss from three-point land. I mean, you you know what they do. They have the four, you know, the four shooters around a post player. And they were just straight bombing in the second half. Incredible Mm -hmm. shooting percentage in the second half. So... You know, that was kind of like the the start of states right there for, say, whatever amount of minutes, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, 37 minutes. But then at the end, when it's go time, BYU made enough plays, made enough shots. And in states' losses, there's only been a few games where they were outclassed. Ole Miss was a bad one. Um, they've had some bad halves. But usually for 30 minutes, they've been with everybody except for maybe a couple games. And then outside of like another handful of games, they're usually with everybody for about 33, 34 minutes in, in the games that they lost this year. You know, how has Texas Tech been in the last three minutes of close games? Do they have that that steely resolve to put teams away and out execute them? Or they've been up and down in that regard too? I think it's kind of very fascinating how it's worked out for this team in close games late, especially at home. I know it's not going to be at home this week, but they beat Kansas State at the buzzer. BYU took them to the wire. Oklahoma took them to the wire on the road. Um, there was another one that just – if you look at the – if you're into, like, the winning percentages or winning probability, it's been, like, sharp declines or sharp, you know, just – Tech's been able to bring it back from, like, 91% plus mm-hmm. at multiple times this season. It's It really is filled, like, McCaslin's able to get them to lock in when it's – late in games and he's not afraid to burn his timeouts if you're if he sees something that he doesn't like he will stop the game with a timeout and he will not he will not take him to the offseason if this if thursday's the last game sure anything else you think you'd like to point out uh last one i i forgot to mention it when i was talking about the, the overall personnel chance mcmillan he's yeah. uh, six man extraordinaire six man he's basically kind of plays that Walton role, but a little bit better and more athletic on the defensive end. They use him as a spark. He started it in one game last year on the last game Tech played against Houston when Darian was out, but and he's he been off the bench. Grand Canyon? Grand Canyon, correct. Yeah. But yeah, he's he's another one to watch. About 40% from three this year, so he's he's really been key for this team off the bench. Cool. We were talking to Justin Apodaco. And, uh, you know, where can we read your stuff this week? What is your Twitter handle? Uh, yeah, redraidersports.com. I'm also in the Dallas Morning News for Texas Tech. Um, find my Twitter at Justin Apod, A-P-O-D. And, yeah, that's where you'll find me. And, obviously, appreciate everybody that supports the Rivals Network.
Cool. Well, we appreciate taking some time. And uh, obviously, all of a sudden, NC State fans are, it's amazing. They they really, at one point, it looked like maybe the NIT, and then now, all of a sudden, Pittsburgh. So, um, you know, we'll see how long the ride goes. I'm sure, uh, you know, everybody's looking at that game with Kentucky and wondering how that might go for whoever wins the Texas Tech. Uh, well, if if Texas battle. Tech can get to the Sweet 16, that Sweet 16 would be in Dallas, which is yeah. five hours from here. So sure, sure. there's that aspect of it, too, where obviously Tech wants to, you know, they're not going to keep that in mind. But it's just if you get there, it'd be a heck of a party for Texas Tech in the Metroplex. Sure. So, well, it's been interesting watching the the rise of Texas Tech over the last maybe decade. And um you know, I remember with Sasser way back when in the day, way back in the day with James Dickey. So that that's how far back I go with uh, Texas Tech hoops seeing the, you know, the various teams over the years, Andre Emmett and guys like that. So it's not not just the recent years, but uh, I do think Grant McCaslin is exactly the coach that that should be their guy for the next decade. Um, yeah. And this roller coaster that they've had with coaches will now officially be over. Um you know, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. Like I was, even the other day, I was like, oh yeah, yeah Texas Tech played for the national title. You know, obviously everybody talks about Virginia and this, this part of the world. So, uh, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, it's good to see Texas Tech back where, where they once were. So, but uh, like I said, appreciate it. And we'll see how this goes on Thursday. Thank you.